The fact is, in America, this is a country where no matter who you are when you're born, it doesn't mean that you're stuck in that spot for the rest of your life. And it's still a land where opportunity exists. That's what the extraordinary American experience is all about. Because we do not say that one person is inherently better than another. If I had believed that as a kid, I would never have left Second Street in Hope, Arkansas in the little rent house that I lived in. The fact is, we live in a country that has always valued the notion that every person has worth and value. And I want us to be reminded of what takes place when a country begins to devalue any group of its citizens for any cause whatsoever. Once the devaluation of a certain segment of the population occurs, whether it's because of gender, religion, race, creed, color, or the age of gestation, then anything is possible. On January the 29th, I was at Auschwitz when nearly 65 members of the Israeli Knesset flew to Poland and was on the grounds of Auschwitz for a special hearing. I cannot tell you how sobering it was to think that the very government of Israel that should never have existed had Hitler had his way, there on that day stood in victory standing on the very ground that was supposed to be the last place where a Jew ever was to take a breath on planet Earth. We look at the horrors of the Holocaust and people say, how could that happen? How could one of the most sophisticated, well-educated, and scientifically advanced countries in the entire planet do something of such magnitude? And I tell you, it didn't happen overnight. It happened as slowly but methodically human beings were devalued. Devalued because of their IQ, devalued because of their physical abilities or lack thereof, devalued because of their faith. And once people are valued to be more or less valuable than others, anything is possible. The fact is, we need to be concerned that if we teach the generation coming after us that some lives are expendable and disposable, and that the reason they could be expendable and disposable is because some lives are a financial hardship to the family, or some are a social disruption. Let's face it, those are the two basic arguments that people use to justify an abortion. It's going to be a financial hardship. I just can't afford it. It's going to be a social disruption. My boyfriend will leave me. I've got to finish law school. My parents will really disown me if they find out I'm pregnant. Look, those are the two basic reasons that are often given to justify this business of abortion. But let's ask ourselves, if we teach the generation coming after us, the ones younger than us, that it is okay to terminate a human life because it represents a financial hardship or a social disruption, what have we taught that generation when they are our caretakers and we are approaching the end of life at the other end of the spectrum? When we become a financial hardship to them, and when we are a social disruption because they have to come check on us on the weekend rather than to go to the lake, we've already given them the full capability to take us out. Now, I'm not going to make it that easy on my children to get rid of me. I'm telling you now, another good reason to be pro-life. But the best reason of all is because I believe that every life is made in the image of God, and I have no right to disrupt that which he has initiated. It's not my life. It's his. I don't believe I can own another person. I thought we settled that after the Civil War. Or as some people in the South, when I was young, used to still call it, the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> the fact remains that for some, what Gary said is so very painfully true. There are voices who have told us, please don't bring those issues up because we want to win elections. So do I. But I want to win them for a cause that's worth fighting for. I want to win them in a way that protects and preserves human life.
Whether it's politically expedient or not is of no consequence to me. I tell people all the time, and this is the God's truth, I did not become pro-life because I got into politics. I got into politics because as a pro-life person, I believe that if we get this issue wrong, we will get all the other issues wrong because at the very heart and cornerstone of our culture is a respect for human dignity and human life. I know we like to pick at members of Congress and nobody likes to do it any more than I do. I don't, uh, I don't do it completely for a living, but I play a guy on TV who does, okay? <laughs> but in all seriousness, earnestness, and fairness tonight, I hope that it is not lost on you that we have members of Congress and the Senate of all the places they could choose to be in Washington, D.C. tonight, and believe me, there are many, many pressures upon them to be in 100 places a night at least 100 a night. There are members of Congress in the United States Senate who are here in our midst. Some who have been here and had to leave to take part of other events. Do not let it be lost on you and please thank them. But also take note of who's here. Because let me just say this to you. It takes a lot of courage for a member of the House or Senate in this kind of environment and in this town to show up at this event and to hang out with people like the rest of us who are unapologetically pro-life because it means that they are unapologetically pro-life. It means that they're willing to take a stand for what's right. And I want to say thanks to every member of the House or Senate who has uh, been a part of this wonderful event tonight for your affirmation that this is not an issue that we should abandon. I, I'm convinced that when I go into Baskin Robbins, one of the reasons that one goes there is because there's more than one flavor. How many of you would go to Baskin Robbins? You wouldn't have said, what do you have today? We have vanilla. That it? That's it, vanilla. You want vanilla? We got vanilla. You want anything else? I'm sorry. We're Baskin Robbins. We're down to one flavor. <laughs> it's Obamacare turned ice cream. It's one flavor. It's all you got. Folks, you know what would happen. People would stop going to Baskin Robbins if they were down to one flavor. Look, I'm convinced that as a conservative, I can be a full spectrum conservative. I don't have to quit being pro-life and pro-family to also be a person who believes that the government should take less money from each family and should spend less, that a government shouldn't spend money it doesn't have and borrow money it can't afford. I'm also a person who believes that it's perfectly within my purview to also put in the spectrum of my conservatism that I believe in national security, that America is an exceptional country, that we are the strongest we can be when we have a military that is so overwhelmingly powerful that nobody ever wants to poke it and attempt to see what it will do. I totally understand that. But having said that, it is not impossible for me then to say, but I will not yield one iota on the notion that every human being made of 23 chromosomes from its mother and 23 from its father, creating a unique DNA schedule never having existed before, that unique human life that comes to be at the moment of conception, that I have a moral obligation before God and a political obligation unto the Declaration of Independence and our constitutional form of government to believe that that life is a life worth living and a life worth protecting, and we can run the full gamut of what we believe. We don't have to be reduced down to one flavor. My dear friend, that's not how we lose an election. That's how we win elections, and is how we save this republic and change the country. Thank you very much. God bless you all, and God bless the Susan B. Anthony List.